are really delighted to have Michael Collins from the University of Wisconsin Madison and also director of the Center for Financial Security there, who has done such important work on financial literacy, particularly looking at vulnerable group. And today we are going to hear about several projects that he has done looking at financial literacy among adults. So we are very excited to have uh, a speaker who is going to present uh, so much work. And we are going to have him probably talk for an hour. And then, as usual, we are going to take a lot of questions and have a discussion at the end. I think one of the things we, we talk about in the financial literacy world is what is financial literacy? And a lot of navel gazing, I think. You know, what is financial literacy? What is financial education? What is financial capability? Um, financial capacity? We have lots of different terms out there. Uh, and the truth is, it's, it's everything. Uh, it's a lot of different things. It's very heterogeneous. And so today, I'm going to really focus on um, what we might think about as information models. Um, there's a long history of, of people making decisions with uncertain information and what happens when you give them more information or more clear, precise information. Uh, and so essentially, the, the, um, the studies I'm going to look at today are about providing people more information to make a decision about their financial choices. Um, in different formats. Uh, in two of the studies, it's an online financial education. In the other, it's more of a traditional classroom setting. But there's lots of ways we can do that. Um, I'm not going to talk about some of the other mechanisms we might think about. But you know, advice is a big one. Financial counseling, financial coaching, uh, financial advising, those are all different mediums that we could think about. Um, and then there's different mechanisms, too, where you might think about products, um, specifically, a, uh, say, a product that has um, um, some built-in features to it that force you to save. So think about some of the um, retirement accounts that have a set retirement date and sort of change the asset allocation over the course of a life course. Um, the truth is, when we think about financial capability, we're talking about how all these things interact with each other. So when, we do the, when you see people like me talk about these studies, it's very artificial, because I'm talking about one specific program for one specific population, ignoring everything else that's going on. Um, I think as we think about the role of financial knowledge and the role of financial education, um, mm -hmm. it's important to, to think about what the mechanisms are. How, how do we expect to see effects of financial education? Uh, one thing is that when you provide financial education to, to any population, you have some assumption about their basic ability to use that information. They have some cognitive processes. So numeracy is a big one. Can they do percentages? That tends to be the biggest one. You know, the ability to do percentages, to do calculations over time. Uh, and then basic IQ as well. Uh, there's a study in Wisconsin called the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study that has took graduates from high school in 1957 and looks at them over their, their life course. They're in their 70s and um, 80s today. Um, one of the big predictors of financial well-being in retirement is taking trigonometry in 1956 or 1957. So numeracy maps, um, numeracy maps. Um, so what's the role of education I think we can think about education in a couple different ways. Is one is that the more I learn, the more information I might want. So if I don't know anything about retirement, I'm probably not very interested in retirement seminar because I don't have any sort of demand for that. So a little bit of knowledge might stimulate my demand for more information. I might become more willing to seek information on my own. I might look for experts to find information from. Um, you know, I just might be more savvy about that. The other thing is that I may want to know more about how to manage my retirement but I don't know how to start. It's, I have to find the information. Um, and I say lower the cost of getting information. I don't necessarily mean that books are expensive. I mean, it's my time. It's my energy. It's the cognitive processes that I have to go through. So when we offer financial education in the forms I'm going to talk about in these three studies, we're either trying to just stimulate that demand to make people increase their appetite for this kind of information and or lower the cost, make it easier for them to get it, um, both the the monetary cost and the time and other kind of costs to getting that information. Um, the other thing to think about is we, we've, in financial literacy and financial education, there's been a lot of talk about competencies, core competencies, so things like budgeting and saving and sort of what are these key areas that people should know. Um, you know, I think the, another way to think about this is what are the decisions that, the sort of typical decisions that people have to make generically. Um, and oftentimes it involves trading off consumption and saving over more than one period. So making a decision about what to do today versus what to do tomorrow, although tomorrow might be a year from now, or 10 years from now, or four years from now. Um, and that requires some information. I need to know how much income I actually have and how much money I'm spending. Um, for some people, that's not a known 
thing. They don't actually know how much is coming in and how much is going out. You can imagine that makes it much harder to make these trade-offs if you don't have that basic information. So that's a piece of information. Another is prices. So prices today are generally known. Most people know how much they're paying for things today. Prices in the future are much less known. So that involves things like inflation. Now we're into percentages. This becomes much harder to do. So now this, these sort of you know, having information about that matters. Um, things like discount rate. How much should I discount the future? That's going to be a personal preference, but I also have to think about that. And how, how does information inform that? Um, risk awareness. I mean, one of the things we think we saw in the, rece the, the recession in 2008 was that people were underestimating the risks of certain kinds of financial choices they were making. Um, so how does information influence those risk choices? Um, there's also institutional risk. You know, should I trust this institution? Should I trust this person who's trying to sell me a financial product? You know, those kinds of social and institutional facts. Um, and then finally, there are skills. And I, two that I think are critical are one is just being able to plan, having a plan, whether it's to get through the week, to get through the next paycheck, to get through the year, planning for taxes, planning for uh, savings, those kinds of things. The other is just coordination. And some researchers have called this attention. You know, do I actually pay attention to how much money I have and how it's being spent, which might sound very simplistic, but there's enough studies now that show when you focus people's attention on financial behavior, they actually do, not only do it differently, they do it better. Uh, so there is, there is part of that too. So um, this is probably for most people in this audience, this is kind of basic, but I think it is important as we think about um, this field to sort of get back to the basics and what is it that we expect to see uh, and what is it that education might influence in this area. Um, so I think what's important about the financial literacy, financial education field specifically, is that there is not great evidence. Uh, and I often am, uh, I'm surprised to, to learn how much evidence other people think there is about this field. So the perception is financial literacy is a big deal. Uh, people have struggled in this recession to manage their money. There must be hundreds of studies. It must be just like math education or um, nutrition education or name another field. Um, and the fact is this field's way behind almost any other domain of education you can think about. We don't have great studies. We don't have good funding sources for studies. We don't have, and we were talking earlier, there's no department of financial literacy at any institution that I'm aware of, you know, any academic institution. So we don't have sort of the research infrastructure build up. It's not clear where you publish this stuff. It's not clear how you get rewarded for this stuff. There's just not a lot of it out there. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I was looking specifically at this issue of employer-based financial education for adults. I found about you know, 10 or more studies about in that range, not that many. Um, over the last decade. Um, the good news is that it's growing. So there's more studies in the last three or four years than there were 10 years ago. The sample size are getting bigger. The approaches are getting stronger. They're controlling for more things. They're trying to come up with a more valid comparison group. Um, we're starting to see more studies that involve longitudinal data instead of just cross-sectional data, which makes it much more likely to be able to get um, some effects. Um, but there's glaring problems in this literature. Um, so it's a small literature. And it's a flawed literature. I mean, it's hard, very hard, I think, to draw any conclusions from the literature that stands now. And the biggest one is the selection problem. So you know, if you're a researcher, this is a common problem with lots of different studies. But the people who show up for financial education are different. They're motivated. They want to be uh, taking action. And the truth is, just by walking in the door, even if nothing happened in that session, they are probably going to do better than the people who didn't walk in the door because they're motivated enough to show up. So we have this huge showing up effect and it's hard to get rid of that in studies without uh, some better control group. Um, another problem is that the programs are highly heterogeneous. And this is an understatement. So we're talking about programs from a 45-minute lunchtime brown bag about your retirement to a six-month intensive financial education for low-income people about how to get into the banking system um, and everything in between. And this all gets glumped together into this financial education study space. And it's, it's probably an unfair way to think about that. Um, each is going to have different effects on different kinds of behavior. And some of these really aren't meant to be one-off programs. They're meant to be part of a continuum um, in combination with other activities as well. Um, if an RCT, a randomized control trial, is the gold standard, it's the gold standard in health, it's the gold standard in many other areas, uh, we're not meeting it. We don't have a lot of randomized control trials in this field. It's, I mean, you can count them on one hand. Uh, so we don't see a lot of um, the sort of level of rigor that we'd expect to see in this field. Um, and then the last thing is we don't have a good standardized measure. 
So if I go to get a physical, my doctor's going to measure my weight and my height and come up with a BMI. He's going to measure my blood pressure and say something about my cholesterol levels, some other things. I'm not sure what those things are in your financial health. What is the equivalent of a financial BMI? What is the equivalent of a financial blood pressure? Um, you know, even how we measure things like assets, incomes, debt varies dramatically across different surveys. And um, different programs, different activities are, are measured in different ways. So um, all these things make it very hard for us to have a cohesive uh, literature that we can conclude much about. Um, so if you're a researcher, young researcher, great field to be in, right? It's a wide open uh, place to begin thinking about work. Um, and I think uh, where lots can be learned. Um, so I'll, this is my last sort of uh, introduction slide, but I get this question a lot. Who cares? Financial literacy, who cares? I mean, it's, it's just people, some people just aren't as smart and they don't do as well. Whatever, we don't care. We, we can't control what people know. Uh, we should just regulate the industry. We'll regulate the industry so that people can't ever get hurt. We'll just regulate away all that kind of stuff. Or uh, another thing we hear is uh, behavioral economics give us really nice tricks to, to get people to do the right thing. So nudge, the classic book everyone's heard about. We can nudge people into retirement savings or not borrowing or whatever it might be. So we can use regulations and behavioral techniques and that'll solve the problem. Um, I, you know, I, I have no disrespect for either the behavioral field or for regulators, but it's not enough. Um, so, you know, we know there's been this long-term shift towards people having to take more responsibility of their own finances, whether it's moving from um, defined benefit to defined contribution retirement plans or managing uh, variable interest rate mortgages versus fixed rate mortgages. I mean, just a long list of things. Healthcare is going to be another big one. Um, there's a lot more technology in how transactions transpire. Um, you know, I can get into a lot of debt pretty quickly with my cell phone. Um, so, you know, we, we have a whole different market. Um, credit used to be rationed, so it was hard to get in trouble with credit because you didn't get access to it. Now you can get access to it, um, but now you can get in trouble with it. Uh, lots of special issues for people who are outside of the sort of center of the normal distribution, right? So people with disabilities, people with low income, low education, non-English speaking. So we can think of lots of ways where there might be uh, problems for those folks. Um, and then lots of folks who have been sort of outside of the mainstream financial market and how do they interact with that market and how do their needs get met. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not suggesting that financial education is the end all be all. It's a silver bullet that's gonna make all Americans financially secure. Uh, and I'm not saying that regulation and behavioral economics has nothing to offer us. I think they do. They're, comp they're nice compliments. But what we ultimately want is people who can dynamically adapt to the situations in front of them. So if I had learned about mortgages in the 1960s, I would not have learned about option arms. Or probably in the 1980s, I wouldn't have learned about option arms. The product didn't exist. So we need to be able to give people enough skills that they can dynamically adapt as the market changes, as their life course changes. Um, and that's a really different set of skills uh, to think about um, than, I th than oftentimes people in the financial education think about. If I just you know, inoculate you with this level of education, you're set for life. Uh, and I think it's, it's a much more dynamic process than that. So that's my, my editorial comment for the day. All right, so I'm going to talk about these three studies. So the first one is um, an online education program for school employees in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, this is a working paper that's still a working paper and um, continuing to think about new ways to approach this. Um, the other is an online education program for employees of credit unions in the state of Wisconsin. If you don't know Wisconsin, there's a big railhead where the, the, in the 1800s, the uh, various agricultural crops sort of met in, around Madison, Wisconsin. All these farmers who came from Scandinavia needed to go to the railhead and drop off their crops and they needed capital. And sort of their experience in Europe was cooperative, so they, forwarded co they formed cooperatives called credit unions. So the world headquarters of the credit union movement is actually in Madison, Wisconsin. It literally is the world headquarters. Uh, and uh, so we have a lot of credit unions. Um, so it is a, a very rich place to do work with credit union employees. Um, the last is a more traditional classroom education for people in a subsidized housing program. Um, I think the idea of integrating financial education into public programs is a, is a potentially very powerful policy lever. Um, so I think that's an important way to think about too. Um, so I'm going to um, focus just on general findings. So I'll probably go through a lot of these findings quickly um, and then get to the methodological lessons and implications of the future. But I'm happy to entertain questions about, about
about methods as well. All right, so I'm going to start with the school employees. So this is um, in Wisconsin, Appleton, Wisconsin, which is sort of near Green Bay. If you follow the Packers at all, um, yesterday was Aaron Rodgers' day, 12-12-12. Um, so uh, what's interesting about public school employees uh, in Wisconsin is they have a very good defined benefit uh, pension plan. Um, in fact, I think in most of the studies of defined benefits, it's the one state that has a plan that's solvent. So we have a, a really good um, benefit plan. Um, but they can also save in other tax-sheltered accounts. Um, so they have the ability to do more saving over and above, and they can actually save a huge amount of their income. I think it's about a third of their income they can put tax-free away into other. So they have lots of tools available to them at the workplace. It's sort of an ideal situation from an employer's standpoint. Um, they have pretty stable incomes. Um, by and large, uh, school districts, particularly in Appleton, have had very stable employment. People aren't getting laid off regularly, and their incomes are, are pretty predictable. Um, another thing that's important is that to the extent that teachers, educational, instructional staff get exposed to personal finance, they might, it might creep into their teaching. So whether it's I'm teaching education and I choose to do some writing or some story that has a financial aspect to it. So you know, Aesop's Fables is one that comes up with English teachers a lot in the financial concept. Um, it, might be it might be in math education. It might be in social studies. So you can imagine different teachers. It might creep in if they felt more comfortable with it. Um, Karen Holden, who's uh, from Wisconsin, and Wendy Way did a survey of teachers with MEFI a few years back, and they found that um, other than math teachers, most teachers don't feel comfortable about their own personal finance, and they don't raise it in the classroom. So perhaps making teachers more confident with personal finance, they might raise it more in the classroom. So this would sort of be a, um, an externality of this particular program, but still, we think it's an important population for that reason. Um, so this is a company called Educated Investor. Um, they're an online uh, provider of financial education. There are many out there. Um, they were just one that was, was easy for us to work with. Um, they created a five-hour online course that was customized for these employees. It involved things like understanding how um, the retirement and pension plan worked and, and why you might want to save over and above your retirement and pension plan. Um, it is a randomized control trial at the individual level, so we randomly assigned each teacher or other, they, other employees besides teachers as well. Um, to either get it or not, and then we followed up three months later. So it's a you know, sort of classic design in that sense. Um, we thought that we would get some change in knowledge if we taught people stuff and asked them questions. We thought they would know more about those questions. So it's sort of a classic education experiment to that extent. We also thought they might have more confidence and that we might see some evidence of more planning or advice um, in, in their behavior. So what did the, the sessions look like? They, they had five modules, so to speak, online. Each took about an hour to get through. So getting started in investing, the basics of personal finance. So the basics of personal finance included things like managing credit, having a budget, those kinds of things. The basics of investing, um, which while well, the getting started was a sort of thinking about different terms and uh, understanding what different uh, instruments might be called, the basics actually got into which one's more risky, which one's less risky, time horizon, those kinds of things. Um, a retirement planning section, which was, was really focused on uh, consumption and retirement and how you think about how much you need to save, calculating how much you need to save. And then retirement saving strategies. So being exposed to tax sheltered annuities, to 403Bs, to other kinds of accounts that are available. Um, they called it a mastery model. So essentially, you would see a section of, of content and then you would get a short quiz, you know, two or three questions to see if you understood it or not. And you could go back and repeat a section if you didn't. So um, it cost about $22 per employee. Um, Apple, Appleton has a little fewer than 1,500 employees, but about $30,000 for a 1,500 employee firm. So it's not, it's not a huge amount of money. For a school district, it actually is it's a fair bit of money. So the, this actually was supported uh, through the Financial Literacy Research Consortium and the Social Security Administration. That's partly why we were able to offset some of those costs. Uh, but you know, for most school districts, this wouldn't be a small amount of money to be able to do. Um, so here's a screenshot of one of the, uh, uh, the, the educational modules. Um, you can see there's a photo. You can see there's kind of a running list of where they're at, and you can see there's text. This looks a lot like a textbook or a workbook. Um, it's, a, it's a good tool, but you know, this isn't. Today, if you were to design a website, it might have some games, some interactive tools, some videos. Uh, you know, 
much more interactive. This is really a sort of static kind of textbook model. So I saw a question. How, were, how did people access this site? Was this located centrally on some employer site? Was it uh, pushed out to It was them? pushed out by email, and so yeah. randomized, and, and who got it. And so they could access it at work or at home. Um, we actually don't know where they did it. That was my next question. Yeah. Um, but that's going to be an important point I'll come back to. So you randomized who got the email? I'm sorry? You randomized who got the email? Yeah. Yeah, it's randomized at the individual level. Um, so here's, I said, the mastery model. Here's a, you know, they asked a question, they click on it, and it tells you immediately if you got it right or wrong. So they can go back and they can revisit the material. Um, very common for, I, I think I just did a, a, a confidentiality um, training for Bureau of Labor Statistics to access their information. Same exact model, right? You answer some questions, and if you don't get it, you go back and you try it again. So um, very, very traditional uh, kind of model. And then at the end, they gave you a summary, and then there are some practical ideas. So they had some calculators built in uh, and some other kinds of tools they could connect to. So it did try to give you some just-in-time ability to apply what you wanted to, to learn about. So there was that built in. Um, so we had about 1,300, well, some 1,400 employees. There were 27 different schools or facilities um, that were uh, in the school district. Everybody was in, involved. Um, we randomized the offer. We couldn't make them do it, so we randomized the offer. Um, they were, it was pushed out to them by email um, at least three times if they were in the treatment group. Um, if they were in the control group, they got sort of a generic message by email that the district cares about their financial life and that, you know, thank you. Uh, so it's very, it didn't have, it didn't have anything about getting the online education. Um, they also did flyers in everybody's mailboxes at schools um, and they put out some information through um, the employee newsletter. This isn't, this isn't, so the company that was behind this sort of was holding their nose this whole time because that's not the way they like to roll this out. They like to do a real big campaign, you know, make a competition, make it fun. Um, you know, we couldn't do that, one, because it's an experiment and only half the people got it, uh, and two, because that's just not the way the school operates. They, they, fun is not part of their, their administration, <laughs> bureaucratic administration. Um, all right, so an important thing is that this was begun in January 2011. I'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Um, we had 717 people who got the offer, 121 participated. So a pretty low participation rate. Uh, I've been involved in some other similar projects. It's kind of in the ballpark. Uh, 15 to 25, maybe 30% take up on these kinds of things. Um, so we had about 55 people who actually started it and finished all five hours um, with sort of almost a linear uh, attrition rate at each level. So people got through one, two, three, you know, sort of on and on. Um, and then we had uh, 679 who didn't get any offer. We didn't have any administrative data. This was the, the biggest flaw with this experiment was that um, the school district and the state pension were willing to share administrative data, but our human subjects was not willing to let us see administrative data. So we were never able to link um, any of the data together. So it was essentially human subjects protection that prevented us from doing this. So um, ideally, we would have been able to see whether they actually contributed to their state um, teachers, if they put it in their teacher savings account. Now, we would not know about other aspects of their portfolio. So they could go through this and decide to put their money into some you know, for, you know, Fidelity or Vanguard or something like that, we wouldn't observe it. But we could have observed if they put it in their teacher's tax sheltered account. We don't. Um, we did a mail survey. It's a 54 question survey. The UW Survey Center read it, sent it out in April. Um, it was a four wave survey. This is a you know, pretty good survey design, four waves. It was a pre incentive. They got a $5 bill. Um, there was an iPad incentive if they sent it back. So um, we got a decent response rate, 52%, which for a mail survey is pretty good. Um, so we had 746 people actually in it, 361 in the treatment, um, 88 who took it, the treatment untreated, and then 385 from the control. So this is, it's a decent sample size for what we're looking at. Um, there's obviously going to be some response bias. The people who responded are probably different from those who didn't, but we're having that with the treatments and controls. So we're, we're sort of assuming or hoping that's random. Um, so here's some things about the sample. Um, older. Mostly women, not surprising, given where they work. Uh, almost two-thirds have kids under 19. 55% um, have a postgraduate degree, very well-educated group. Um, a third have been in that job for more than 15 years. Uh, and 
a lot of high incomes. So household incomes more than almost two thirds are above 75,000, which in Wisconsin is a lot of money. Um, which is partly why the public is really angry about public school employees is because they have incomes that's like a full standard deviation above the median, but that's a different topic. Um, about 57% have a financial plan, much higher than the general population, if we look at something like that. Um, three quarters use direct deposit. 19% have calculated their retirement needs, which might strike you as low, but remember they're in a defined benefit plan, so it may not be a high priority. Most are women, they probably have a spouse. I mean, there's probably lots of explanations why this might be the case. We would have predicted that we might have seen that go up um, as a result of the training, we, but we don't. Um, they have about, on average, almost four months, three and a half months of a reserve fund, which is, again, above the average. This is actually what financial advisors suggest, and they actually do it. Um, and they're not particularly financially worried on a five-point scale for, for whatever you think that's worth, that subjective scale. Uh, so this is too small to read for me, but... <laughs> Essentially what we find here, and I'll summarize this in another slide, is there's an effect on knowledge. Um, both self-assessed knowledge, self-assessed knowledge. So by self-assessed knowledge, I mean how much do you know about credit? How much do you know about saving? How much do you know? So we see big effects there. But we also see effects when we give them an objective test. So you know, the, you know, a question might be something about the difference between stocks and bonds in their risk portfolio. And so you know, they do better on test questions than they do they uh, provide uh, more positive answers about their knowledge levels. Um, we don't see any effect on confidence, although it's the right direction, on uh, savings. Um, you know, most of these things are the right direction. Think, thinking about retirement is actually negative, but most of the other things are in the right, the right direction, but just not statistically significant. So this could be the intervention was really weak. It could be that only a portion of the people who were assigned to treatment took it up. Um, or it could be that we didn't have enough time to observe people in this setting. But we clearly see some effects on the knowledge levels itself. Um, so what I've been showing you so far is the intent to treat. So this is the average effect among all the people who were uh, assigned to the treatment group. So the effect had to be big enough for this 23% who responded to swamp the other 74% who didn't, uh, or whatever the number is. That's my own math numeracy here. Um, their self-assessed knowledge was greater. Um, and then higher test scores. The effect sizes were relatively small, although I think this is debatable. It was about one-sixth of a standard deviation, which equates to about a, you know, a little less than a 0.2 um, effect size. Actually, in the education literature, for most math and, and re reading um, curricula, that's about a, a pretty typical effect size. So the effect size is actually small, maybe, but not by standard education, particularly for a five-hour course. Um, so. Um, if we were to do some sort of a treatment on treatment estimate, so if, if everybody in the treatment group had actually taken up the treatment, what would the effect size be? It might be as big as two thirds of a standard deviation. It might be much bigger. Um, there's different ways we've tried to look at this, but um, we didn't see any effects really, uh, statistically significant effects on behavior. Um, and when we do try to control for other stuff, really age describes most of the behaviors. So most of the behaviors I talked about before, about retirement planning, about um, you know, aspects of, of um, financial management just get better and better with age. Um, so once we control for age, it kind of takes away a lot of the effects. Um, so about a 4% average treatment effect. Um, the treatment on treated effects, so the people who were assigned to the education and actually did it, the effects were four to five times larger, about 19%. Um, we also tried using uh, treatment as instrument or variable to predict whether they took up the class. It was obviously a good exogenous predictor. Um, and the effect size is sort of in that same, same ballpark. Um, we didn't find any strong subgroup effects. So um, there wasn't a bigger effect for women than men or by age or by education uh, level, those kinds of things. So it was a, you know, sort of an average treatment effect that held up and didn't see differences across groups. But again, we didn't see any evidence of um, changes on retirement calculations, um, planning, those, those kinds of things, uses of advice. Um, so I think, you know, a question is sort of what do we, what do we make of this? So here you can see it. Uh, maybe you can see that one, that bar is a little bit higher than that bar. I mean, these aren't these aren't huge effects. Um, but again, in the education literature, this isn't that far off from what you'd expect to see from a math curriculum or a, a reading curriculum. Um, so here's the question about what did the teachers do with it? So in the survey question, it was like, how likely are you to use the education content in your work or teaching? Um, and you know about a third said either very or extremely likely, and another 
22% or so, 24% said quite likely. Um, so there might be positive externalities that we're not observing uh, in terms of they, it started to integrate into their teaching. This is their intention, not what they actually did, but it's, um, it's suggestive that perhaps this kind of education, even if it didn't directly affect the teacher's behavior, it affected their knowledge made them feel a little more confident, and maybe it starts to creep into their education. Now, you should know Wisconsin's one of these states that has a an, an financial education mandate, but that most districts don't do it because there's no money to do it. Um, so we don't test on it. And so for most of these teachers, um, it's not part of what they do in, in the normal course of what they do. All right, so why did I tell you about January as being an important thing? You may remember this in the news. There were protests because our new governor at that point in time wanted to make the teachers pay for their own retirement. So, right, we didn't know, see this coming. <laughs> we, we planned it for January, and then the protest started. So this low take-up rate, um, a lot of teachers were doing this <laughs> during the experimental period. Um, lesson learned for field-based research. Uh, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, I'd love to be able to repeat it at a time when there isn't turmoil in the state capitol. Uh, but this, I mean, this is a big deal. And, and so uh, some of our survey questions and some of the write-ins on the surveys reflected the fact that teachers were pretty angry about this, you know, that they felt the mistreatment or the, you know, that the state wasn't treating them well. So, um, and we sort of, being the university, were somehow implicated in all that. Um, all right, so an uh, important thing about this, this was voluntary participation. People were not, these, these teachers, fa faculty, uh, uh, instructional staff, and others didn't get paid to do this. So they had to carve out time from the rest of their work day to do this, or they had to do it at home. Um, and remember, 58% of them have kids under 19. So that's, that's what it is. Um, the pension reform, not a small disruption in the, at least the culture of what's going on. Um, these are a pretty homogeneous group of, of employees. They have a pretty well-defined um, pension plan. When I presented this on campus, uh, some of my economist friends said, should you find anything? I mean, what, what could these people possibly do? They have like the best possible uh, financial scenario I can imagine, right? They, they have stable incomes, they have a fully funded pension, they're probably doing just fine. They took the course and now they realize how well they're doing. All right, that, you know, that's an argument. Um, I think we would like to relook at these. We'd like to do this again, obviously, in a time when there wasn't turmoil, um, but maybe be able to follow up with people again be able to look at their behaviors. Um, you know, perhaps it's um, combinations of behaviors or just more planning and more um, attention, essentially. So this is gets at some of the attention issues we could think about. Um, we clearly see effects on knowledge, though. Uh, and private, previous studies have not always even found the knowledge part. We found the knowledge effects even as an intent to treat. So the effects were big enough that it's not just selection. You know, it's a randomized control trial. We think there's real effects. Um, I think there's a lot more work you can do it would be nice to do this someplace where we didn't have all the, the controversy. So this is a study of, uh, again, credit union employees in Wisconsin, same, similar online course. Um, difference is they could complete, these, these are credit union employees, they could complete this on work time. 10 hours of work time, they could get paid to do the online class. Big difference. Um, we collected data at three points in time, sort of a pre, so we had some baseline information before they got offered the education a sort of in the middle and then later on. So we had three points in time. Um, and we weren't able to do a true randomized control trial. This is sort of a quasi-experiment. Essentially, we took the credit unions, um, I forget there are 50 or 60 of them, we divided them into two groups randomly and said, you guys get it in the fall, you guys get it in the spring. So the spring group became the control group for the fall at that first January follow-up. So we could look at the, the change from, from September to January for the fall group versus the spring group. The spring group hadn't gotten it yet, so they became sort of the quasi-treatment group. Um, obviously, we got a control for a lot of stuff, but um, it's a helpful, helpful model. Um, all right, 10, 10 hours, nine modules. Um, this was pretty intensive. Same screenshots, though. I showed you before, mastery model. Um, I like the company. I, I think their content is good. It's certainly as good as any you know, book you would pick up on financial education, but it's it's like a book. It's an online, you're reading it on a screen instead of on a page. Uh, again, you can imagine where you got some really high-end web designers who made like cool interactive video gaming kind of things. This wasn't it. This was a pretty, so I, I would couch both of these studies as sort of a lower bound, perhaps. If you, if you believe that more interactive means better learning, this might be a, a lower bound. 
Um, so we did an uh, online survey, emailed survey. Um, we had 323 employees in the control group and 729 in the treatment group. So it was about 50 credit unions who were in the sample. Um, the credit unions varied in size. Um, the smallest had maybe two or three branches. The biggest had 20 plus branches. Um, the asset sizes ranged pretty dramatically too. The number of members ranged. Um, many of our credit unions tend to be glumped around some of the metro areas in the state, but the metro areas are smaller places like Wausau or Appleton or Green Bay. So um, these aren't mega credit unions that you might be familiar with. So they're, they, a typical credit union had about 100 employees and a few had less than 50 employees. So it's a, a sort of a range of different, uh, different credit union types. Um, we had good information on the credit union. So we knew um, the branches, we knew the, 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 the um, number of members, we knew the assets, those kinds of things. But here's what's particularly important. 80 to 90% of the employees who were offered the course took it up. And so this was shocking to me. <laughs> uh, I've never been involved with a project with take-up rates this high. It's not mandated. They did get paid to do it on work time, but there's lots of things you can get paid to do on work time that you don't do. Uh, and so part of it was that the credit unions made this really fun. They had competitions by branch for what percentage of employees at that branch would exceed um, certain thresholds. So if you got 80%, you got a lunch pizza paid for by the company. And if you got 90%, you got like, I don't know, a cocktail party or something, um, something further. So um, there was this sort of strong social pressure uh, from your colleagues to take it. Um, interesting though, it was strong even among people who were like at central office and places where you think might think it would be different. But um, this is a different sample. It's younger, uh, much less affluent, predominantly female. Uh, remember, in credit unions, credit unions that are different from their financial institutions, they're really retail banking. So it's a lot of tellers, a lot of you know basic administration of transactional accounts. Um, most of our credit unions aren't doing investing. Most do mortgages and auto loans, and that's about the end of their portfolio. I mean, it's a pretty Pretty simplistic. Not all. I mean, some are, are beyond that, but the bulk of their employees are in the their sort of retail side. Um, all right, so I'm uh, showing the effects here. These are the changes in behavior relative to the control group. So these are sort of effect sizes. Controlling for age and gender, um, marital status, for income, um, for the credit union size. Um, we actually did this with a credit union fixed effect. So most of the observable things we have about the individuals and the places where they work. Um, and we see about an 8% change in opening an IRA. Um, this got a little smaller when we did some more robustness tests, but it still was in that 4 to 5 to you know, 8% range, which is pretty, I thought, pretty high. Um, recall that this was launched in September. January, a lot of companies do benefits enrollments in October, November, December. So we caught people at a really good time. I wish I would say that was intentional. It was luck. Um, but you know, they got the information, and they had the opportunity to act on the information pretty close to each other. Um, establishing a budget, um, drafting a financial plan, setting aside three months uh, expenses. All these are self-report. We may have trained people how to answer questions. I'll give that. But we had lots of other questions that were also positive behavior. We didn't find these kinds of effects. And the education was around these kinds of topics. Um, so just to drill down a little bit farther on and what we're seeing here. Um, after four months, the contributing to the IRA, you know, up to an 8% change, um, a written budget, the financial plan, having savings. We didn't see any change in saving for long-term goals. Um, this may be a function of the fact that these are younger folks, and so maybe longer-term goals weren't as much part of their, their current thinking. Uh, we also saw the knowledge changes. So here's what I think is kind of interesting. So if you're in, if you're in retail banking, Interest and loans, credit scores, these are things you're probably dealing with quite frequently for yourself and for your clients. Um, investments in uh, stocks, uh, stocks and bonds and investing for retirement are probably things you don't deal with as regularly. And here we see much bigger effect sizes. So they probably started at a lower level. There was more potential for, for knowledge gains there, and we saw those. Um, the effect sizes here are quite large. I mean, some of them are as big as you know, half standard deviation. So it's um, a much bigger effects here. Um, so here's the wave. One is September, wave two is January, wave three is later in the spring after both groups got it. So the, the treatment group here, you can see from their baseline to after getting access to the education, see a pretty big uh, change in their knowledge scores here. Um, this group didn't get access to it, so they were kind of flat. 
and then they caught up after they got access to it in the second period. This is reassuring, right? So this group looks like that group after they both get a sort of level playing field in terms of access to the education. Um, again, this is self-reported knowledge. Um, may, you know, maybe we just taught people to give us the socially optimal response, but it, it seemed to work in both places. Um, retirement knowledge, kind of similar kind of pattern. Um, and here's having a written budget, similar kind of pattern. Um, we did see some decline. I'm not surprised. Starting, writing a budget is easy. Maintaining a budget is much harder. Uh, probably we'd see, if we went another period, another decline there. Um, but still, it's, it's certainly different from where it started. Um, all right, so problems with this. They're credit union employees. How generalizable is that? Um, and some level, I think, if we can train credit union employees, they're already sort of the experts, and, you know, to some extent. Like, if they can show knowledge gains, what if you took a group of employees that worked in manufacturing or something that's completely you know, orthogonal from, from a financial world? Um, Self-report, you know, I, I, we may have taught them how to answer questions. It's, it's possible. Um, the high participation rate, is this an anomaly? I mean, credit unions employees are just really good people. I, I would give you that. Um, but, you know, it's hard to know uh, what was going on there. Um, but you know, let's say the direct costs are $33 per participant, and let's just say that if you count up their lost wages by having to sit in front of the computer and do this, and the opportunity costs, and the admin time, and the promotion, and everything else, call it 10 times larger. Um, you know, the, the payoffs here, this isn't a huge cost. You know, maybe it's three, dollars $400 per employee. Um, you know, per perhaps there's some, some real payoffs here. Um, you know, think about the externalities of having a retirement fund or of these employees working with their members, working with the, the members of the credit union and saying, so I had this happen to me where I was at my credit union, which, which just exposed my bias about credit union employees, uh, where the, you know, I was cashing a check or depositing something. He, he said, you know, have you ever thought about opening this you know, IRA CD product that we've just come out with? So I mean, he probably got some incentive to say that, but um, you, know, you can think about, they might be more comfortable with that kind of thing after having this kind of knowledge. Um, I think we can do more work here about the evidence of their planning. I mean, I think planning is a key part of, of what the education was around. And then sub subgroups, you know, do we see bigger effects for certain age groups or women, those kinds of things. But um, I'm encouraged by this study because we actually have some behaviors and we have some knowledge. Um, not randomized trial, like the first study, but still I, I'm encouraged by the, the direction. All right, so the last thing I talk about is this small field study. Um, it's Community Development Corporation of Long Island. It's an excellent CDC uh, based in Long Island. They are, for the state of New York, they sort of contract out their housing voucher program. So subsidized housing, the Section 8 voucher they used to call it, they subsidize out to nonprofits to run these. So they have it for, for Long Island. Um, remember, Long Island is a pretty high housing cost market, right? So houses at this point in time, uh, well, rents at this point in time were uh, quite high because they're sort of in the, the uh, Long Island housing market, which is, is steep. And these are people who on average, uh, you know, they were making between twelve and $18,000 a year. So pretty hard to afford housing if you're a working family in, in Long Island. Center Reach, Long Island is where their office was, but they covered the whole region. Um, what's important about the, the organization is that by uh, regulations from HUD, they have to verify income every year because you get kicked off the program if your income goes up. Um, they have to um, look at assets so they collect savings accounts, and the organization had chosen to pull credit reports as well. So we had credit reports over time, we had bank statements over time, and we had verification of income, which was mostly pay stubs, although they, they also collected um, tax uh, returns for, for their clients. So they have good data. Um, so that was an important thing. Um, and they, they, uh, these clients were involved in this family self-sufficiency program, which is an, a, a really uh, sort of groundbreaking program that HUD put forward to try to help families to earn extra income and be able to save, but not jeopardize their access to their, their income support with, through the form of this housing voucher. Um, it's a very traditional uh, financial education course. It was required. If you didn't take it, you lost the voucher. So for a lot of families, this was you know five, 600 bucks a month they would lose if they didn't follow through, mandated. Uh, this was like the dream of most, most uh, researchers that we can mandate people to do it. So 181 people uh, were deemed to need the education by the end of 2007. We randomized them at the individual level, the two groups, uh, those that got it in 2006 and those that got it in 2007. Same idea, the 2006 people were the treatment, 2007 were the controls, and we were able to compare the two. Um, we had 144 consent to be in the study. Again, human subjects hurt us a little bit here, and then we ended up with 73 treatment and 71 control. 
Um, so um, everybody got access to the education eventually. Um, we did have some consent issues. Um, we can observe the non-consenters. What we heard is that um, the people who didn't consent, uh, many of them were getting off the program. So they didn't want to sit through 10 hours of classes. They, the main way that you get out of Section 8 is you plan on moving or you marry because uh, then your income no longer qualifies you. Or maybe they get a job to make more money, but that's hard to predict. But marriage is a big one. Um, they were about $100 in financial incentives plus for trans transportation meals and child care provided. Um, some clients didn't accept because they didn't want to wait. So a few people actually were so eager to get the course they wouldn't consent to be in the study because they wanted to take the education right away. They were different, but we got those out of the way and they were not in the study. Um, the big thing, the big problem we had was attrition. Um, we lost um, some of the, the, the participants for um, basically because they were not responding to the follow-up survey. And in most cases, it was because they left Section 8. Uh, and I'll show the numbers in a minute. But the main things is that single people were more likely to leave. Uh, people who had small rent amounts, uh, large rent amounts, um, and small tenant portions, uh, and then child support. So what all this indicates to me is these are people who are involved in relationships. Um, and are getting smaller subsidies from the program. So there, there is more incentive for them to potentially get out of Section 8 into private housing, possibly through marriage or through partnering. Um, so we lose them from the program. Uh, savings levels are pretty low. The net wealth is low because there's a lot of debt. I'll talk a lot about debt. Um, credit, uh, credit scores are pretty low. Um, so it just gives you a, a quick sense here. So. Um, oh, here's the attrition rate. So 6% for the controls, 18% for the treated. So that's a, that's a problem. Um, so we estimate effects a whole bunch of different ways here. So we do treatment untreated. Uh, we do just a straight up treatment effect. We do um, propensity score matching. We control for a bunch of stuff. Uh, instruments, I mean, it's like every, try to push the data as far as you can, thanks to my reviewers uh, in this paper. Um, here's the big finding. Uh, debt increased for the group that got access to the education by about $4,500. Um, different models varied from $4,000 to $4,500. So I've presented this before, and people say, that can't be. We're supposed to teach people how to save, and you're teaching people how to borrow. All right, so I'll let you think on that for a minute. We didn't see any effects anywhere else. No delinquency effects. No FICO score effects. No, sub, no uh, FICO score being above below the subprime level. Um, now, the self-reported behaviors, controlling spending, paying bills, planning, saving, budgeting, all positive. So people self-reporting doing these behaviors more often. Although the saving didn't hold up. Um, saving follows what we found in the actual data as well. Um, so it's a small sample. Um, but most of these results held up to all kinds of different things we could push on it um, and different uh, approaches. We also did a comparison of self-reports versus the um, actuals and actually people are, you know, what they say they do is actually you know, kind of close to what they actually do. Um, so there's some correlation there. Um, so here's a, a picture of the debt levels for the pre and post and then the treatment pre and post. So it goes up, it goes down for these guys and up for these guys. That's actually not statistically significant, that one, that one is. And the difference between the two is, is significant. Um, but here's the FICO, FICO score. Credit score is pretty much flat for both groups. So they're using more debt, but they're not getting into trouble. We didn't see more delinquencies. Anything like that. Um, so I think the big question to ask yourself is, should people making $15,000 a year in a high cost housing market like Long Island who have kids be saving? What, what did they learn to do? They learned to borrow. They learned to borrow on average about 25% more than they were borrowing before they got access to the treatment. But they didn't have more defaults. So here's a, I think this is an open question. Is this a good thing? Um, if you're trying to figure out how to make ends meet, how to get your kids into activities that they need to be involved with, borrowing might be exactly the right way to do it. And borrowing smartly, borrowing without defaulting, could be a very good way to do that. I mean, I think we could argue that's a, that's a good thing. Um, so, I mean, financial education might raise the confidence and lower the information barrier and help people to get into credit and then manage credit successfully. Um, now, I've had colleagues say, well, wait a second. What if ignorance is actually welfare enhancing? So not knowing how to get credit helps you from getting access to credit, which gets you into trouble. So somehow, if you get access to it, you get into trouble. Eh, you know, I think there's an argument there. We don't see it in our data. We'd have to get more data down the line to see if three or four years later this was a trouble for these folks. Um, I think my takeaway from this is 
we have to be careful about what we think is the right thing for people to do, especially low-income people, because borrowing may be the right thing to do, and saving may not be the right thing to do. I mean, if you had to put money away and then forego feeding your kids, or feeding your kids mac and cheese instead of a healthy meal, that's, that's not the trade-off we want you to make. We want you to invest in your kids, invest in your future, and if you have to borrow to do that, that may be okay. Um, I also think that maybe part of what we need to do in financial education is think more about product access. So we're gonna teach you how to manage credit and teach you how to trade off different kinds of credit options and then how to manage it. And so maybe more of it needs to be on, you know, you're gonna borrow more after this class. How do we help you do that effectively and carefully? So what do I think the ideal study is? Like I said, we've done this enough times now to think what we should do better next time. Um, I think randomization is key. Um, randomization at the individual level uh, isn't key. And then with strong incentives to participate. So maybe what you randomize is the incentives. Everybody gets offered the education, but we randomly provide an incentive for some people to take part in it. And maybe the incentive is you know, 50 bucks or 100, you know, some strong incentive to encourage people to get in. And that could be our exogenous variation we can identify off of. Um, I think consistent content is important across studies, but we need to understand that the mode, the pedagogy, how you teach really matters. So this sort of static web page you know, maybe not the best approach for a master's degree holding professional. Uh, you know, maybe we need to think about different kinds of, of techniques. Um, I think longitudinal data is important, both to catch short run, what do you think you're gonna do? What do you think, you, what do you say you're gonna do? And then follow up and see what they actually do. Um, Self-report is correlated with actual behavior, but administrative data I think is key. So credit reports are a, one really good source, bank accounts are another potential source. Um, you know, it's interesting, the self-assessed knowledge, I was, I've always been very skeptical of any self-assessment. You know, how much do you know about that? But it turns out to be pretty correlated with what people actually think and do. Um, so I think we need better measures. I mean, I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, one thing that's clear is don't know really matters. So people who don't know are very different from those people who, even if they just randomly check one of the other answers. Uh, so don't know says something about people's financial capability, generally negatively. Um, whether it's I don't know how much I have or those kinds of things. Um, we need more validated measures. I think that's a, 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 an easy one. And then you need big sample sizes because attrition's a big deal. Um, longitudinal data on financial stuff, you lose a lot of people. Um, so those are my main, main takeaways there. Um, lots of challenges. I think this is slow and incremental work. I've got a long career ahead of me. Um, <laughs> costs are high. Costs are higher than you think um, for field work in general and for this kind of work too. This is, these are not unique to financial education. This is just in general. Um, it's hard to find champions and outlets for this work. Um, I worry a lot about fidelity treatment. So in the financial education that was classroom based, I actually met with the educator who did it so I knew exactly how it was done. But I think it's really easy for that to get skewed. Um, you worry about crossover, so people who, in, who weren't supposed to get the education got it. Uh, lots of selection issues, both extensive and intensive. So whether they get it or not, and then once they get it, how much they do. Those are both um, going to be issues. Um, attrition bias, consent bias, these are all whole issues. Um, so I'll, I'll end on a optimistic work. I think the field's come a long way. I mean, we've, we've focused more on these teachable moments. Um, things like rules of thumb, technology, I mean, these are all sort of more recent innovations that I think could help us do better. Um, this idea of knowing, planning, doing, you know, we realize that people have to sort of have intentions and follow through with them. Um, goal formation, I think that's more and more part of what financial education is about. It's not just terms and conditions, but um, getting to move forward. Um, thinking about um, issues of attention, uh, getting to overcome self-control, those kinds of things. And practice, giving people an opportunity to actually practice, I think is an important part of where we're at. Um, you know, I think sometimes we have to ask whether we're asking too much of financial education. Um, there are te technical aspects of learning that we can teach, whether it's interest rates or compound interest, those kinds of things. Um, we can do this. This is also true for something like obesity, right? So you hear right now a lot of talk about anti-obesity. So we need to teach people how to exercise, how many minutes of exercise or diet or, you know, get counseling. These are all very, these, you could, these are analogous to everything we've talked about in financial education, right? Um, you know, but at the end of the day, people have to actually do something. Um, and I, you know, we have to be honest about the fact this isn't operating in a vacuum. I'm sort of ending where I started, which is, you know, financial education is a piece of the puzzle. It's a complement, but we have to have things like product access and advice. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot more to the story than just the technical aspects of this. And I think that's where financial capability, financial education um, should go. And that's hopefully the, the next few studies we see in this area will start to begin to focus more on that too. So with that, I'll stop. One thing that seemed to be missing uh, on the list of things we might need, actually I was thinking is a theoretical model, 
right? We haven't done, I think, uh, a lot of theory here. And actually, this might explain why not for everybody is optimum, yeah. right? First of all, to change behavior, to invest in knowledge, or even to save, right? And so, you know, um, I wonder whether you can say a little bit more about this. The other thing that was interesting here, when you, you know, when we consider the adult population, uh, that's different than, you know, having uh, literacy in the school, yet, you know, we take them to a type of classroom type education, and I wonder whether you can say a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, this issue of what's the theory of financial education is one that comes up the most, actually, among people in education um, who don't have a clear theory about their own, <laughs> their own work. So it's interesting, interesting dialogue. Um, so there have been sort of economic models that have been put forward and what's the role of information in that model. Um, and there have been studies that sort of loosely build on theories drawn from like public health or from you know, other domains where we're trying to think about behavior change. But the bottom line is in this field, people really believe financial education works, and they just want to sort of throw the black box out there and see what comes out the other side, and then whatever happens, they sort of take credit as a positive aspect. And I think you know, there have been a couple of uh, sort of literature review kind of papers recently have come out and essentially say the same thing, which is we need to better understand what the mechanisms are. Um, and I think part of the challenge is it's going to vary by population. It's going to vary by the form of the education. It's going to be varied by what the outcome you're worried about. It's going to be very different from retirement than for getting a bank account. Those are very different kinds of aspects. So I think that's going to be a, um, it's an area that needs more work. Um, so, you know, young researchers go get it, um, I guess. So you had a second question, I can't remember. I think the second question was, we are talking about adult, adults. Uh, and this, you know, it's different probably in yeah. terms of the, what we have learned from the high school education. It's very different, and I, um, you know, ultimately we need to think about financial education as a life course. And so the, it's going to be a lot easier to teach people as adults if they have some basic foundational work as youth. Um, the needs of adults are very different from the needs of youth. So like I said, a, a, a high school kid probably doesn't care a lot about how mortgages work, but if you're 32 and about to, sign, about to sign the closing papers on a loan, you need to know a lot about it just then. And so there's a sort of just-in-time nature to the adult education that I think online could provide pretty well. Um, I also think that adults are, um, they have learned to be much more eclectic in how they get information. So they might take a course and go online and buy a book and ask their friend who's an expert and uh, talk to somebody in the business who they don't know if they're really an expert or not. And so there's, there's a much more uh, filtering process that has to go through with adults. And you know, some adults have that skill more refined than others. So with, with kids, it's a little easier. It's, it is a bit more of a black box. You know, we, we deliver a certain content. We have certain learning objectives. They achieve them, and we check the box and say that's great. With adults, it tends to be much more nuanced and I think much more heterogeneous. So it's hard to say, um, you know, this is the, I get this question all the time. What's the best curriculum that I should offer to my clients in my nonprofit program? I don't have an answer for that. I mean, it depends who your clients are, what their needs are, and it's going to be a customized kind of issue. I had a question about the, the last study. How far did you break down what they were using this extra debt for? Was this, you know, cash flow management, durable goods, or was it, you know, financing a trip or, you know, entertainment expenses? Did you guys get into that? What we observed was the credit report itself, and what we had were the, the um, aggregate balances as of that point in time. So we knew it was on a credit card as opposed to a student loan, but we didn't know what the spend was like. Um, we did have questions in the survey about purchases of um, things like um, things for their kids, essentially. So um, I'm blanking out what some of the items were, but essentially enrichment activities for kids and for cars, which was a, a big purchase item. And we didn't, most of them didn't own cars. They were, which in Long Island is really hard because it's not a good public transportation. Um, so we saw a few people buying cars, but I, there was a corresponding auto loan usually in those cases. Um, the average value of the cars were you know in the like fifteen hundred dollar range, so it wasn't like they were buying new cars either. So we don't, but we don't know about durable goods and those other items. Do we know anything about anything at all about the difference in, uh, in effectiveness of different modes, uh, so, say in person uh, versus online, versus we'll send you a book or? <laughs> a study that Peter Zorn did a long time ago with Freddie Mac, where they compared different forms of housing, uh, counseling slash education 
and found that the classroom was, in some versions of the study, stronger, um, that the workbook was low impact. Um, I don't find any of that particularly surprising. I mean, I think having a more interactive, more engaged format would work matter, work more. I, you know, I don't have any data on this. My belief is that online could be more effective. I mean, I say this as somebody who actually gets paid to do face-to-face -face education in a classroom. But I do think that online education, particularly for adults for a topic like this, could be more effective than, than a classroom-based. Do you have a sense of the cost-benefit uh, of doing this? Because my view on some of the work you did, in particular if you think of um, financial education, so it was really brought back to me from your question, is that you know, in an online education, in this setting, the cost can be relatively low, uh, yet kind of the benefit uh, in particular in changing behavior, you know, even when you have 8%, but people save more or have precautionary savings seem to be relatively high. So I don't know if you have done a formal cost benefit, perhaps, you know, in other work or so on, but can you say maybe a few things about that, uh, that part? Yeah, um, and, and th this same question came up. We did some work in New York City with uh, people who are in a public program there, and we found some positive effects, and the same question came up, you know, what's the, what's the return on investment? Uh, one of the challenges is that many of the benefits are private benefits. So the main beneficiary of much of this is the client themselves. So the traditional economic response would be, well, they should pay for it. So, you know, we should charge a fee for this kind of work. Um, but I think we know that the, it's hard enough to get people to do it if you pay them to do it, let alone if they had to pay for it. Um, so what we don't know is what what are the externalities of this positive? What is the externality of having a retirement account, of, of being financially stable? Does it reduce recidivism into public programs? Does it, um, you know, the uh, mayor of Bloomberg in New York City has made pretty strong claims that the more they integrate this financial capability work into their public programs, the more it's going to save the city money because they're not going to have people who, they're going to be more self-sufficient and more able to do things on their own. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of data to back that claim up right now. So I think it's an area we need to do more work in. The challenge is going to be really what's the cost to the public of people being financially insecure. So we, we know there's simple things like they go bankrupt or they, um, they're for close or you know, there has some other, they need public assistance. But it might be things like stress. It might be things like not missing work. It may be things like uh, we have a researcher at Wisconsin now who's looking at how um, high debt levels impact child maltreatment. So you know, actually, the stress and other financial issues might, re might result in more people being referred to child protective services, more children being referred to child protective services. Um, and so part of the intervention they're working on in a randomized trial is getting people, parents who've been referred to child protective services into some financial counseling and to credit uh, support, that kind of thing. So the, you know, the externalities could be big. And so the cost benefit, um, it wouldn't take many kids not going into foster care to make a $33 intervention uh, self-sufficient. So, um, I think there's a lot more work to do in this area, but it certainly seems like the costs are relatively low and the potential benefits, even if it's a low probability, are pretty high. How about workplace? Because the employer can have a benefit, right, of yeah. having a workforce that perhaps doesn't run into that, doesn't miss work or things like this. Yeah, the, um, this seems like the holy grail, I think, for, for a lot of financial education is to figure out how to make employers more interest, self-interested in having employees with good financial education. They're beginning to get there on health. So employers are more and more willing to invest in employer health education and nutrition education because it lowers their cost um, down the road. Um, we haven't seen as much of it on the financial side. There have been a few studies that have been done. They've been pretty small and not well designed. And so I think employers have been not that well um, convinced by the data that's out there right now. But again, I think it's a place where there's there's lots of research opportunities in this area, for sure. More questions? All right. So actually, help me uh, thank uh, Michael for being here.